Welcome to TurboCAD tip number 35, TurboCAD Mechanical Design Considerations. Do you ever wonder if TurboCAD is up to the task of getting your design from table napkin sketches all the way to the market? Well, I can state unequivocally that it is. This tip, in part, will show you how TurboCAD can be a major player in your mechanical design process. Over the years, I've had a number of inquiries about how one should go about designing something. To answer this, I'd put together a couple of tutorials explaining the process as I saw it, and I have presented it in earlier tutorial works. First in Modern Desk for TurboCAD version 11, and later in Modern Desk for TurboCAD version 15. More recently, I presented that information in Rolltop Computer Desk for TurboCAD version 19. Modern Desk is no longer available, but the Rolltop Computer Desk is. It still contains valuable information and should be looked into if one is interested in design and woodworking and other general information on the topic. So be sure to check out TurboCAD Tip 25 as well, which basically introduces the Rolltop Desk tutorial. In this tip I'll also share my experience with mechanical design with the intent to manufacture. I'll discuss how I begin a design and what my thinking looks like as I progress. I certainly don't profess to know everything there is to know on the subject, but I do think my real-world experience can help lay some foundations for the process. My real-world experience in mechanical design began in 2009 when I was contracted by a glass door company to take them from the 2D world of CAD drawings to the wondrous world of 3D. The glass doors I'm referring to are the types that can be found along the dairy, freezer, and meat aisles of most grocery stores and convenience stores, liquor stores, and whatnot. They can also be found on all manner of merchandisers, lab fridges and ovens, on deli cases and vending machines. It's not common knowledge, but most companies that produce freezers and coolers, as those in the retail stores, make only the cases and purchase the specialized doors and frames from glass door companies like the one I was with. As you can imagine, it's a huge market. There are some major case manufacturers that do produce their own doors. A couple that come to mind are True Manufacturing and Hussman, but they'd follow the same design process that I did. I eventually became the senior full-time product design engineer and was hired on as a full-time employee when the company was sold to an investor group. My role expanded exponentially over my years there and I was tasked with many engineering processes, some of which I'll mention as we work through this presentation. I should mention that I started with TurboCAD when I began the conversion to 3D, but we changed to SolidWorks in 2011 because it was easier to share files with vendors. Since no one had TurboCAD, the change to something more in line with the industry made sense. In addition to this, we were developing so many new products that the lack of automation and parametric capabilities in TurboCAD made it much less efficient. I still used TurboCAD for all my renderings and many of the other things like plant layout, but SolidWorks became the main CAD workhorse. Even finding TurboCAD not quite up to snuff in my glass door design work, I still believe TurboCAD is awesome and can be used for manufacturing, but perhaps on a smaller scale operation or where not so much new and evolving design work is done. So nothing's more satisfying than see the product you've designed, of course along with your team, in a local store. One of the major case suppliers in the U.S. and Canada is ZeroZone. They supplied the cases with our doors to a new Save-On Foods here in Saskatoon, and man was I ever excited to see them all. All 150 plus doors, with the exception of nine in the milk area, were ours. The ones in the milk area were in a used Hussman case that was still in great shape. So you can't fault them for using that case, as Hussman is a huge player in the industry with a very large footprint in the market. So let's talk about the design process. These days the only things I'm designing are for tutorial production, but that doesn't mean I don't think about all those things that are required for actual production. Recently I produced a tutorial series on a gumball machine. Although these machines exist in the real world and there exists huge amounts of reference material on the internet and in the world at hand, I did design this gumball machine from scratch. It does however look much like the beaver round. If a product already exists, one can study the real-world product to get ideas. If something exists and no patents exist, or the patents have expired, one can actually produce exact copies if desired. I did a lot of reverse engineering from existing products in my glass door work, but that was to see what the competitors did, and then we took steps to improve the product and make them more efficient. 
With the bubblegum machine, I also purchased a $9 CAD toy and was quite amazed at the engineering that went into making it and making it available for such a low cost. I know that it would have cost quite a lot to get this to market, but since the market is so huge, they can sell it cheaply and rely on the numbers of sales to make it profitable. The moral of this slide is to study reference material and determine what is required and try to figure out what might make it better, while being affordable to the market for which it's intended. Some things are so well engineered that you're hard pressed to make something better, but in other cases one can easily see ways to improve the design. So after deciding on the general design of the gumball machine, but really not having worked out the details, I started to determine gear types and sizes. I discovered quickly that the gears were not standardized parts so would require a from scratch design. To help with the number of teeth and the sizes that would result, I used gear design software to get an idea about what might work. In this case, I used Matthias Wandel's gear generator software. It doesn't have bevel gear capabilities or the style that I needed, but it sure helped me come up with something that I thought would work size-wise. The ratio is such that one full turn of the gumball machine handle results in a third turn of the dispensing disc. The double bubble toy has a 6-tooth spur gear and an 18-tooth ring gear. That gives the same results as the 9-tooth spur and the 27-tooth ring gear. Here I tweaked both gears from the gear generator exercise and came up with a 9-tooth rounded spur gear with an inward draft angle of 13.3 degrees. The dispenser incorporated a type of 27-tooth ring gear, if that's what it can be called. I did 3D print the two of them early in the process to ensure that they would mesh well enough, and sure enough they did. With the slow directional turning and next to nothing for force, it's no wonder a design such as this seems to be favored by all those I examined on the internet and on the cheap toy from Walmart. So next I needed to work out the coin mechanism. I found via a Google search and a number of gumball repair videos that the typical width of a coin mechanism is 3.5 inches or about 90 millimeters. I knew the size of the coin I was using and the various tolerances I wanted to include. From there it was a matter of building up the mechanism one piece at a time, keeping in mind that the coin had to travel through and out into the lower housing, avoiding interference from the chute that would be close by. I also made some tweaks as the model progressed. One in particular was the length of the T-handle shaft. I needed to place the spur gear at just the right place to interact well with the dispensing disc once that was finalized. Next I worked on the base and the lower body. I knew I wanted two separate components as this would be different from what I saw in many existing machines. I also decided to add a coin access door at the bottom of the lower body. My research showed that the typical way to retrieve the coins was to remove the globe and the contents, as well as the upper portion of the body. Then you'd tip the coins out while trying to ensure the coin mechanism didn't fall out. My design allows the owner to remove the coins without disassembly. This addition will add to the cost of the gumball machine, but it might be a selling point that will enhance its appeal. To enhance this feature, I added guide walls in the lower body, which I feel makes good sense. The lock is a standardized part, readily available. I did tweak the latch a bit, but that part alone can be easily produced in bulk at a reasonable price. If this wasn't the case, I could rework the way the access door and lock mate to the housing and settle with the standardized single directional latch. As for overall size, I based this on visual appeal and how the coin mechanism fit into the housing and what I knew the gears would require in the upper housing. Next, I worked on the further development of the dispensing disc, keeping in mind that the standardized size of a large gumball is 1 inch or 25 millimeters. From there, I worked on the upper housing, ensuring that the bottom of the dispensing disc meshed well with the spur gear of the coin mechanism. Next, I worked on the chute hood. Once the dispensing disc comes around to the front loaded with one gumball, something's needed in that area to keep other gumballs from traveling down the chute. I noticed in my research that Beaver, a major player in the gumball machine industry, uses a series of springs fastened to the upper body. The double bubble toy had a well thought out setup that allowed one ball per dispensing disc chamber and only one would pass below the chute entry wall. Mine is similar to the Beaver model, but I used a solid adjustable hood instead. Now that most of the challenging parts were designed, it was on to the chute. It was pretty straightforward for the most part now that the available space was determined. I wanted to ensure it would slide into the lower body and not require any additional fasteners to hold it in place. 
The overall size of the gumball machine and various placement of parts allowed me to add a post clip as an afterthought. I thought that was a pretty cool addition. Like the beaver machine, I added a logo to the door, in this case a fictitious name, TurboVend. Next I worked on the agitator and agitator nut. The agitator needed to be mounted to the dispensing disc so it could turn at the same time while being able to spin freely around the central post. I came up with the agitator nut that would screw into the dispensing disc while applying pressure to the agitator and keeping it linked with the dispensing disc. Next I worked on the upper assembly which consisted of a lower globe ring, a pair of gaskets, a globe and the globe hood. These were very straightforward, mostly made by revolving 2D profiles into 3D objects. For overall size I measured some reference material I found on the internet and adapted it to my liking. So to learn how to scale an image in TurboCAD, check out my TurboCAD tip number one. So lastly I added the central post and the globe cap lock. I couldn't find much for reference material on the lock and I decided that a simple threaded device would suit the design. It looks like it requires a special key, but it works with a specialized wrench that would be supplied with the machine. I did see a similar design in my research, so it's not unprecedented. So as simple as a gumball machine is, the designer would still need to think about many design considerations that are required by local, state, provincial, and federal governments. This might include food safety if the gumball is considered food. Looking back at the glass door industry and understanding that although the doors look simple, there's really much more to them that meets the eye. As such, there is much to be considered. Their makeup includes insulating glass units, for which we tempered our own glass that needed to meet established standards. We offered heated glass, which means electrical considerations. We offered anti-sweat and anti-fog technologies, which means more energy consumption considerations. Since the doors are used in the food industry, they had to adhere to strict food and safety regulations which are really extensive. Over the years, tighter regulations on energy usage have made it more and more difficult to make them efficient. That's good for the world as a whole, but much tougher on the designers to produce. As hinted at, there are a huge number of regulatory things to consider when manufacturing, and it's up to the manufacturer to find out what that is. Some of the other things in this realm are conflict materials, hazardous materials, product safety, fire hazards, electrical safety, and even ISO if you want to be a player in the modern world. There are many, many more, so be sure to check out what is required if you're producing something you hope to provide to the world. So let's not forget the most fundamental thing of all, the drawings. I didn't produce drawings as part of the gumball machine tutorial, but I did for the boring head tutorial as seen here. The drawings are going to tell your vendors what you expect part-wise. They must be complete with proper views, fully annotated and dimensioned. They must contain tolerances and they must list expectations with regards to materials, material hardness when required, and finishes. Don't leave anything to guesswork on the part of the vendor. Design with reasonable tolerances in mind as the tighter the tolerances are, the harder they are to produce and will end up costing much more. Both materials and tolerances were things I found challenging. I always discussed materials with vendors before defining them on my drawings since they could provide their expert opinion based on years of experience. As for tolerances, most standardized parts have them available if you look for them. Tolerances on new parts need to be defined and I always found that long-time workers in the plant could help with that, especially the owner who knew the parts inside out. Things like aluminum extrusions, well the Aluminum Association has them available, which is also very handy. You should note too that in this day and age most vendors want 3D models to help at their end. There are numerous file formats in TurboCAD to share the models, but if your vendors use an industry standard CAD system like SolidWorks, it may prove beneficial to move in that direction. But it would really need to be worth it financially for you. Prototyping is another area that engineers are familiar with. These days prototyping is much easier with the availability of 3D printers and affordable 3D printing agencies such as Shapeways. As you saw earlier in this presentation, I did an early 3D print of the gumball machine spur gear and dispensing disc. In my work with glass doors, I always use my 3D printer to check the general look, size, and feel for each part. 
I would often see that what I thought looked good on screen was too small to be practical. The only issue with office type 3D printers is that they're not great with tight tolerances, but it was always good enough for an initial review. As I got further along in my designs I would utilize Shapeways since the type of 3D printing they did offered those tighter tolerances I needed. It was certainly more costly than the office printer, but not as costly as ordering a large number of parts and finding they're not quite right. As such, prototyping is just one of the costs of doing business, as that saying goes. Be sure to check out TurboCAD Tip 33, which looks solely at 3D printing. So part sourcing is as important as all other processes, and a great deal of thought must go into it. As mentioned previously in designing, it's good when you can use standardized parts. Just look for the best prices on these, including availability and shipping costs. Since it's unlikely that you can make your whole project with only standardized parts, you'll need to have a number of parts manufactured and shipped to your facility. Looking at the gumball machine, quite a number of things could be made with zinc. This will require zinc die casting. Although a good price is the ideal, it must be balanced with other concerns. The biggest one, in my opinion, is where to get one's parts made, locally or overseas. Getting them from overseas locations will likely be the cheapest, but will it really be in the end? In the glass store business, we got a lot of our parts made overseas because the price was so good. But start having problems with quality and then see what the cost is. Sending a couple of reps on a trip overseas to see what they are doing in the factory is going to cost in the area of $10,000. Start having to send more and more parts out for lab testing to see if the parts are up to snuff and you're looking at thousands of dollars a year just to be confident that you're getting what you expect. And then what if you find a batch of failed parts? Well, perhaps you have to stop production for a while. That could cost a fortune in lost revenue and perhaps even cost you some customers. Even then, it's not an easy decision. For example, I had an American firm that continually asked me if they could quote some parts, so I decided to let them have a shot at it. I don't remember what the part was, but they had quoted $23,000 for the tooling, and I think about $5 per part. I can't really remember what it was, but we can use that as an example. The overseas place we worked with on many occasions didn't charge for the tooling at all, and the price per part was almost half of the American quote. When I discussed this with the American firm and asked why the difference, they said that they couldn't make it for the cost I showed them from overseas. They said that they could offer quality on a continual basis, that we didn't have to worry that we would receive any of the rejects buried in amongst the regular supply, and that if service was ever required, they were right next door, so to speak. That I know is all true, but it is still a huge difference in price and with there being such a small profit margin on our fully assembled systems due to competition, how do you say yes to the local guy? In the end, we stayed with the overseas supplier and dealt with the grief that almost always came with inconsistent quality. Of course, there's other reasons to get your parts locally and that will need to be part of your deliberations. Internal product testing and lab testing of vendor supplied parts for hardness and things like that is a must. It's vital to ensure your vendors and your assembly line folks are keeping up the quality. I'm not sure what the test apparatus would look like for the gumball machine, but it would need to have some way to insert a coin and crank the handle repeatedly. Having a worker stand to do it manually would not be efficient since you would want to run that test continually for days, perhaps weeks. You'd want to get up to 200,000 to 350,000 cycles. In the glass door business, we had test equipment that would open the doors fully to their hold open lock position and then release them from the hold open and let them close via their self-closing devices. One of the things that was a real concern other than the more obvious things like broken glass, broken handles and failing gasket seals was the hold open. It had a bracket that would ride along a shoulder bolt and squeeze fit into the locked position when the door was fully opened. That continual sawing motion was hard on the shoulder bolt and if the hardness was not just right the bracket would saw right through the bolt in short order. Far less than the strived for number of cycles. In the case of these parts, we sent a number of them out to independent labs for hardness testing with each batch we received from the vendor. We also had a lab of our own where we would put our doors on live cases and look at how they performed, making sure that insulating glass units performed as expected and ensuring there were no air leaks at corners or misplaced or damaged gasket seals. 
It's a lot of work and costs a considerable amount of money, but again, it's just part of doing business. Most products will need some kind of certification before they can be introduced to the world. That's a good thing since it keeps us humans safe. These certifications are awarded through accredited labs like Intertech and Underwriters Laboratory. I'm not sure what the gumball machine would require as far as certification goes, but I expect there'd be some. In the glass door business where I worked, I was the lead engineer dealing with getting our new products certified. During my tenure, we worked mostly with Intertech. They were easy to work with and generally got the testing done quite quickly. In my role, I prepared technical summaries and product information packages. I dealt with any issues that they had concerns with, and I tell you that was not unheard of. Sometimes I had to work with vendors to get their products certified so we could use them in our products. Having them certify their components meant that we didn't have to pay to have those parts tested independently at our cost. Once the product was certified, we were allowed to mark the product labels with their respective logos. The testing process was straightforward enough in that we sent the product with assemblies, basically, and they put them through the tests that they were required, electrical, sanitation, and whatnot. The tests could be extensive depending on the product. They would even include impact testing on the paint we might be using. Somewhere in the process, design and utility patents must be considered before your product goes to market. Patents protect your work, although the cost involved can be significant. I think one would be hard-pressed to get a patent on a new gumball machine without some very significant new ideas. I think that the Beaver Machine Corporation, formerly known as Machinomatic, might have that market sewn up as far as bubblegum machines go. A quick search showed more than 100 patents. Actually, the search results said 250 plus. When I worked for the Glassdoor Company, I was the main engineer liaison with the patent attorneys. Having been named as one of the inventors on five patents, I was familiar with each product, so it made sense for me to work with the attorneys, supplying drawings and other required information. I was always amazed at the depth of the knowledge the patent attorneys had. Mind-boggling, really. Although I used SolidWorks in these instances, TurboCAD can certainly compete with patent drawing creation. I've seen many examples of this. A major part of design and manufacturing is getting the product built. Although most parts will be brought in from vendors, whether standardized parts or manufactured parts or even sub-assemblies, they will need to be brought into one's facility for completion. That'll include packaging and shipping. What this will mean will depend on what one is manufacturing. Will it require a new assembly line in the facility? Will it require new fixtures, punches, saws, milling machines, and other assembly line items? Will the new line require additional plumbing, electrical, and air to help facilitate the assembly? Will the new line require additional staffing, and will those new staff require training? A single gumball machine assembly line might look like a simple adventure, but it is likely that someone producing a gumball machine might actually have several types which might each require a separate assembly line. At the glass door company I was with, we had many products and many assembly manufacturing lines. As I mentioned, we even tempered our own glass and built the insulating glass units. They are called IGUs. As such, we had a glass cutting line, a glass edging line, a glass bus bar line that was for heating the glass, a glass tempering line with originally one large tempering oven and eventually two, we had a long 4L line for automated IGU production. We had a number of aluminum swing door lines with specialized saws and fabrication punches, an extensive aluminum frame line with its own specialized saws and CNC machines. We had several lines for a variety of PVC swing and slide doors as well as viewports. As required, we had a huge storage area for inventory of parts and a huge area for shipping. We also had a box shop for building crates and a maintenance shop with tools to help maintain the facility. In addition to all of that, we had a beautiful office area with private offices, engineering office, boardrooms, and a training center for sales teams that would visit when needed. It was a huge operation in a 150,000 square foot area with room to grow into the other areas that were left unused. I think the total footprint of the facility was 225,000 square feet. 
Somewhere along the way, packaging schemes must be considered. This could be for both product packaging, if it is something that might be sold in a store, like the digital reader illustrated here, or just something that needs to be boxed or crated to get to OEM customers or distributors. This is also a costly part of business and of course must be considered in the pricing of one's product. I always found this to be an enjoyable task. It allowed me to be creative, something that always made me happy. Next comes shipping. One of the projects I am most proud to be named as one of the inventors was for a PVC slide door system we sold by the thousands to a case manufacturer in Mexico. They made bottle coolers, think Coke, Pepsi and whatnot, and we supplied the doors of course. In the original scheme we shipped about 120 systems per 53 foot trailer. We came up with a new nesting scheme that allowed for 450 systems per semi trailer. That's 3.7 times more and that actually reduced the shipping costs by 67%. Similar results were found with shipping containers, but not as great as the trailers since the shipping containers are smaller. Speaking of shipping to Mexico, one of the things we needed to consider when shipping the PVC systems with their insulating glass units was heat. It's a long trip to Mexico and the temperatures in Mexico and in the trailer can be sweltering. We added capillary tubes to the IGUs and modified the PVC frames that had enclosed chambers to include airways. Using refrigerated trailers was considered at one time, but that proved to be too costly to move forward with it. An interesting note about the boxes we used in this scheme is that we designed cocaine sniff holes at key locations so that they could be easily checked by drug sniffing dogs at the border crossings if and when the trailers got checked. Manuals and brochures are things that will be required for every product. Whether it's an assembly manual, a repair manual, or instruction sheet, TurboCAD can help with the illustrations, if not the whole project. The gumball machine would certainly need all of these, and I predict it would be fun to produce them. Note the assembly instructions on the right. I produced those for one of my long-term clients a number of years ago. It's nice to see that they're still using them. As you know, once you have a product idea and then take steps to manufacture it, it won't sell itself. You need an in-house marketing and sales staff or you'll need to hire a firm that specializes in these things. The images shown here for a tutorial I wrote a number of years ago show that TurboCAD can be a big part of the process. When I was with the glass store company, I was the graphics department and I created all the brochures. Eventually, the investor group holding company decided that they would have their own people do all the marketing for all of the companies they owned. It did make sense, and although I was saddened to lose that role, I still supplied most of the images they used in our brochures and on the website. As you can see, TurboCAD can do a pretty good job with one's graphic assets, as they're called. If you are an investment group funded manufacturer, there will be times when you'll need to prove you are worth their continued investment. This would typically be once a year, but it could be much more often than that, depending on expectations. When I began to work at the glass store company, it was owned by one individual. He was quite the visionary and a very talented engineer. He knew the business inside out and was a great guy to work with. Eventually, he wanted to expand into a larger part of the market and, at the same time, an investor group sought him out and offered to purchase his business. He decided to do so and stayed on for two years as part of the deal, aiding with the transition. Once the investment group had their own holding company calling the shots, the business expanded rapidly, but there was a lot of unnecessary stress generated because of it, mostly due to numerous management changes. During the last part of my working time there, they were building a new facility on the other side of the country, and I heard just recently that they shut down most of the facility that I was so familiar with. I think they kept some sales offices there, but I believe they let go all of the staff that used to assemble the products. Although I'm retired now, I will be forever grateful for the opportunities I had becoming the engineer I always dreamed I would become. I learned so much, and I gained a renewed appreciation for engineers worldwide who help design and build the world we live in. I especially like the industry I was in because it benefited humankind by protecting our food supply and helped with lowering energy consumption. Who can argue with a cause like that? Well, I'm sure I've missed so many integral parts to this process, but hopefully you found what was here valuable in some way. If you'd like to see additional TurboCAD tips for free, visit Don Check's TurboCAD Tips page. 
If you're interested in delving deeper into additional TurboCAD learning, be sure to check out the full project tutorials on my Textual Creations shopping page. Bye for now.